feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. But a- Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. Coming to you virtually from Seattle, the Pacific Northwest, or as we like to say, the PNW. And again, today, north of the border. We are in Saskatchewan as well. You'll learn more about that in a second. Listen, if you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, this is the podcast for you. We like to think this is where street smarts and book smarts collide. I'm Dan Whedon, and my co-host today is Phil Simchich. Welcome, Phil. We'll be talking to you in a second. We are thrilled to have our, for our guest today, Kim Carrick. Kim is the founder and owner of Scratch Distillery in beautiful Edmonds, Washington. She's now a repeat guest and also a sponsor of the show. We're really excited to talk some genealogy and spirits in the spirit of the season. Welcome, Kim. We'll be right with you as well. Everybody, listen, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and of course, YouTube, we are ubiquitous. We come to you from about a dozen cities and growing, Atlanta, Boston, Boca Raton, uh, newly in Columbus and Knoxville, and coming soon to New York City. Now, before we bring on uh, Kim to talk some gin, vodka, whiskey, and some cocktails, Phil, how's it going up in the great white north? Dan, we're doing great in the great white north. Winter has arrived and it's definitely white. It's definitely white and uh, and probably you're going to have a white Christmas, you think? We are pretty much guaranteed to have a, a white Christmas, so everything's good. And the benefits of a white Christmas, you can keep your beverages cold outside in the snow, oh. or you can use fresh fallen snow as, as ice if you don't mind a little dilution. So, so Kim probably can can help you with some ideas for that. But before we go on to, to Kim, I was in a meeting yesterday, Phil. I thought uh, this might be kind of an interesting uh, kind of plead the fifth for you. We had a breakout room that we did. And the question for each of the members in, in the breakout room was, uh, if you had a client, a favorite client or a, or a successful client engagement that you had, if you had a client uh, next to you and they were asked to, to describe uh, working with you and, 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 and what it was like to, to work with you and the, the benefits and the value. Phil, I'm going to put you on the spot with a little plead the fifth. What would your best client say they like about working with you? That's, that's an interesting question because when we're consulting and helping somebody to grow, we're coming at it often from our methodology perspective, but the purpose is to help them achieve their goals and objectives. And I think one of the the biggest factors that that we as consultants bring in and that I've had this experience is that we can often see their potential much more clearly than they can because they're stuck in the day to day. And some famous marketing person said you, you can't really read the label from inside the bottle. So we can see what they're good at and what they need to do to complement their their strengths and, and build. And, and then that's how you grow companies from 8 million to 50 million to 96 million in, in annual revenues, because we can um, we can think big, we can, we can instill some of our confidence in them into them and, and help them get out of the day to day. And it, it's really avoiding the growing pains. And, and so that we're putting the structures and, and systems in, in place. And I had one company grow from about 25 million to 35 million in one year. So somewhere around 40% growth. Well, you can't just staff up and, and explode by 40%. You need a lot of things in place. So that took a couple of years of planning and, and preparation to, to get there. So it, it's that that thinking big, but with a lot of the, the, the real professionalizing of management and systems and strategies behind it that they're not even aware of because they're so focused on the customer in the short term. Yeah. So I'll share with you mine. Mine was two. I only had two. I said, I said, I pick up, he would say, I pick up the phone when he calls uh, because 99% of the time I do. Uh, and the other one is I'm going to tell him what he needs to hear not what he wants to hear. So those are my two uh, that, that I went with. But I'm gonna bring, Phil, I'm gonna bring in Kim on this. I am one of the scratchers. I'm a, I'm a member of the Scratch Distillery membership. So I get, I get 
a whole bunch, and I know this is terrible radio, but I'm going to, I'm going to show this beautiful uh, whiskey that you make Edmund's own whiskey with the uh, port cask finished. Kim, what would, what would your, your scratchers say they love most about scratch distillery? So as far as the club itself, as far as the spirits club, uh, I would, it's tough between the social aspect, the comfort of the place and the exclusivity of things like that particular whiskey you just showed. So the port cast finish is a club only. So we have certain spirits that we release just a club. Right now in the background, we're actually battling, bottling our second apple brandy. It's gonna be club only, or at least some of the things are club only for the first month or two. And then if there's some left, maybe we'll open it up to the general public. Um, but that port cast finish is very exclusive, very small. So it is uh, an example of one of the club only offerings. So Phil, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in uh, and, and ask a follow up question or not. I'm gonna make a comment for anybody who's listening only uh, to the podcast. Go to YouTube, watch the video because we we are looking at the operation. We, I love it. We're looking uh, right behind Kim. That's not a virtual background. That is her operation really? in in full mode. And uh, I'm gonna ask a, a quick follow up. You know, you mentioned uh, the ex exclusivity. Uh, you're familiar with FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. I know that one of the reasons that I'm in your membership, I, there's, I, got, a, I got FOMO on, on your whiskey and your gin and all of that. There's a fear of missing out. So uh, I, I know that uh, that probably is, is important to some of your members. I, I'd agree. So, so Phil, I, I'm going to let really you take like, over from here. <laughs> yeah, I really like the membership and the exclusivity. I, I want to back up to the uh, beginning because a, a lot of business owners want to understand your path to growth. So one of my first questions is, like, how did you start? Did you start with a business plan or did you start by winging it? Um, a combination. <laughs> um, I would say that the uh, I thought I had a business plan, but the direction the business plan, plan has taken has definitely morphed. But um, the original plan was to make everything from scratch. So, but it was only going to be three baseline products. So, making a base vodka from scratch, meaning that we have in the tanks behind us, we do the whole production. So, we get raw grains; um, they're milled for us. So, we do the mash, do the our own fermentation, distill it, age it. Everything's done here on the premises, but I never planned on doing whiskey. I never planned on doing liqueurs. It was going to be a base vodka that was going to lead to two flagship styles of gin. Um, in addition to those three spirits, it was going to be um, our genealogy class. So I'm convinced everybody can like gin. It's had a bad rap for a long time, and that's finally more uh, hip, but uh, I'm convinced everybody can like it. It's just finding their own flavor profile because it's endless. It's, you know, a bazillion things. Do you have a question? For awesome. And so, I, yeah, I, I like how it was a combination of, of winging it and actually like having a structured plan for, for some guideposts uh, uh, along the way. Dan, over to you. Uh, you know, I, 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 I love the story. And actually on your website, you talk about you, you call you call Scratch Distillery, not just a business story, but a love story. And, and I think that the, it's interesting because this is an entrepreneur, entrepreneur podcast, uh, how you came into the entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur in this. Talk, tell everybody the love story behind the story. So my husband and I met uh, at Michigan State University decades ago. <laughs> um, and uh, it was an exchange of a uh, gin and tonic he was drinking for a let's say lower expense college age beer that uh, he was a you know senior classman and I was a lowly freshman. So we exchanged a gin and tonic for my, uh, my beer and the rest is history. We've been married 29 years and dated for five before that. So that's kind of the fun campy background, but we work really well together. Um, I'm very fortunate that I know a lot of couples could not work together. Um, so he's an optometrist. He went on to optometry school. That's his day job, but this is our passion project. It's my all, all in. And then he's with me anytime he's not doing his day job. And I usually see him there when I walk in. So you you have him doing some some hard labor in the background usually. Yeah, background or on the weekend. Now he's fully engaged in tasting room. 
COVID's, you know, talk about having to pivot and figure things out. So we had to get very lean. And so I had to make him work, you know, more, <laughs> more in the tasting room. Yeah, it's great to hear in terms of family businesses, because when spouses can work together, there's a really strong foundation for, for the business. So again, back to your early days, what were some of the obstacles that you encountered that you expected, or maybe that you didn't expect and, and had to overcome? So even just before we got the doors open, um, a lot more expensive than what I thought it was going to be. I thought I did my research. I didn't do my research well enough. And so there's always, I've never built my own home, but I should have known from people talking about how you always have unexpected expenses that come along the way while you put it in the scheme of this kind of equipment and things being shipped from Germany and delays of that. And the, the, the exchange rate was at the all time low on our side, of course, just by the time I had to pay for this stuff coming from Germany, um, different things as far as equipment wise, floors having to be ripped out to be reinforced for the strength of the, the floor to hold the weight of all the tanks, boilers, all, all that stuff. I am not mechanical. I'm more the arts and the detailed business side of things. Um, so, which I like that combination, mechanical parts, not my thing. So that part's been the the frustrating, really hard part. <laughs> so I know it's got to be also frustrating and hard is what happened around March of 2020. You, you were a guest. You were one of the last studio guests we had. You were the first, the first guest in January of 2020. Two months later, the world basically came to an end or to a, a screeching halt maybe is more appropriate. That had That had, I know, a huge impact on your tasting room and 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 what you were doing in that regard. Talk about that time and and where that's led you to a couple of years later. So when when it hit, just like everybody else, uh, you know, you're just in shock and like, wow, I didn't see this coming because of course nobody here in the U.S. at least saw this coming, and so it was okay. Didn't know that this is how I was going to go down, but let's uh, let's see what we can do to avoid that. And um, the whole sanitizer thing, um, you couldn't find sanitizer anywhere and it wasn't uh, available. Um, the way we make everything, we make it from scratch. It's incredibly expensive. It costs us seven times more to make a bottle of spirits than it does for something that, you know, somebody else can buy massive made alcohol made in other parts of the this country. Um, so for me to make even my sanitizer from scratch would be way more expensive than what people really want to pay. Of course, at certain times they would have paid anything, but, um, but that's not why I was doing it. And we had first responders we were trying to donate to, but anyways, the way that I, uh, I think got creative about it was I reached out to different, um, partners in the industry. So breweries that were shut down that had beer that was going to go bad, um, wineries that might have a barrel that just doesn't taste that great, that they're not going to do anything with. So I got already fermented product and I distilled from that. So I didn't have to start all the way from scratch. So it was much more cost effective. So that way I could do it at a reasonable price or give it away to the first responders and, um, build a good, you know, keep us. I only had, um, a couple full-time people at the time and many part-time people. One of the full-time people, she left and went back home. She was um, a little freaked out. The other one, I was a, he's a, my production guy. So I was able to keep him on um, by making sanitizer. So I was able to keep him with me. Um, my husband and I, it was just three of us for a long time. And then my other part-time people, most of them have day jobs or are retired. They do it because they love us. They love the family of the business and um, they would come in and work for free. They wouldn't let me pay them. They would, you know, so that goodwill that we have from just the environment and the family type of business, but um, just the creativity of pivoting and saying, how can we do this and, and contribute? So that was at the beginning. And then we we're closed, of course, you know, it was a table up by the front door. People came to the door and we, you know, not inside that whole crazy world. And then it evolved into now a couple of years later, we were able to, um, acquire space outside on the deck before legally in the state of Washington distilleries could not have outdoor space. Um, we, we were treated very differently than wineries, breweries. Um, 
ironically, it got passed during COVID, but it had nothing to do with uh, COVID itself, but we were able to um, get a law passed that allowed us to have outdoor space. And that saved our bacon because for so much of the time when we're totally closed down inside, you can do some online sales, which we certainly do a lot more than we used to. Um, so it's been great in that way that people realize they can buy online and they can have things shipped to certain areas. But, um, but to have that outdoor space where we had two fire pits and pop-up tents that we put up when we need them and people come down club members come down in the middle of the snow and had a blast you know it's just at this point you do what you got to do to stay sane and we were the total opposite of everybody else staying home and um, not leaving a computer I, I barely sit down you know so I'm constantly here and producing and moving and creating something new now so now we have um, also part of that bill that passed was to allow us to serve more than the two ounces per person per day that we were limited to for the first five years of business. So now we can serve real size cocktails. We can, um, people can be here longer than the, you know, 20 minutes it takes to do a tasting and, and move on their way. So the social aspect has increased as well. So, um, people that come weekly, that this is their, their happy place, their safe place. It's a comfortable, um, kind of hit place to be and you got outside and inside and we'll continue that as much as as much as we can. So you've survived and innovated through the last couple of years. What do you see as some of the trends or opportunities for you in, in the next couple of years looking forward? So the, the diversifying of the product, um, because now we can serve um, real I call them real cocktails. <laughs> so we can uh, the more things I make, the more uh, variety and and uh creativity I can get within the cocktails and do a lot of the classic cocktails that have a little bit of liqueur, a little bit of Amaro in them, um, things that I didn't use to make. So now I can make them all from within our product. And most importantly for our spirits club, it gives them diversity. So it keeps them in, engaged because they get things that they, um, you know, it, if you only had three spirits, three bottles a quarter gets kind of boring. I mean, for some people they're very regimented and they only get the same things, but most people like to mix it up. And so now we have, we went from that three products to we have about 25 SKUs now. So wow. it's hard to keep it all in production is the challenge. Um, hence why we bottle two things at a time sometimes, or I have to split a run into three different spirits. It's not the most efficient, but right now I couldn't get wheat in time to get, you know, supply chain, shipping, all that stuff. So you just have to keep innovating on that side too. It's like, okay, how can I get three products out of this one run? Cause I'm not going to have more material for two weeks. <laughs> so it's just having to stay on it and, and get creative. And, um, but the diversification of that, and then this uh, genealogy at home is a new version of our gin class that we just rolled out literally a week ago. So, um, that's a whole nother topic. I'll let you well, and we're going to, and, and you know what we have to, we have to take a break to pay the bills, uh, so to speak, Kim, but we're going to talk about the genealogy at home when we come back. Uh, we're going to take a short break to hear from today's spotlight sponsor. And when we come back with our guest, Kim Carrick, for our hot or not section of the show, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kim, is it on the rocks or is it neat for her? Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the shrimp tank. If you'd like to grow your business, increase revenues, and raise profits, would more financing from your banker help you grow? Who's guiding your succession plan? Would you like more control over your business so you can sleep better at night? SME Business Wealth Builder works with business leaders and owners like you to help them grow their business and build their business wealth. For more information and to check out free resources, go to smewealthbuilder.com. All right, welcome back to The Shrimp Tank where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I'm Phil Simchich and today our guest is Kim Carrick, founder and owner of Scratch Distillery. For our next segment, Hot or Not. And as a former guest, Kim, I know you know how Hot or Not works, so we're gonna, we're gonna dive right into it. You heard me tease it out a little bit. For you, for you, Kim, uh, do you like your 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 spirits on the rocks or are you like me and say, no, give them to me neat? So because they make so many different things, that's a, a complicated question. But because you're <laughs> speaking more specifically about whiskey, I was uh, knowing that that's the thing you have on your desk there. Um, for me, neat. Um, neat, okay. But that also, 
but that also depends on what you're drinking. So right. ours is 83 proof and meant to be a nice sipping. Whiskey does not need to be watered down or impart water to open it up. So it's the, the more complicated grains that are a little softer, not in your face, and as well as uh, right. higher ABV proof. So I do neat. Okay, well, I, I, we're, we're on the same wavelength there. And by the way, Phil, I have to tell you, as I before I shoot it over to you, I text Kim the other day because I, I went in and actually picked out my, my club membership. I do that uh, fairly regularly because I like the new stuff. And I, and I text her and I said, I'm in love. The coffee mint, I, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. The coffee mente, mint, how do you say that, Kim? So uh, cacao, so chocolate, so chocolate mint liqueur. It was so like a chocolate mint, mint liqueur. It's like a chocolate and I took one liqueur. sip. And I said, I, I now have a new favorite liqueur. And I actually went on the text and said, I'm in love with it. Uh, so yes, I think that when you mentioned the diversity before the break, I, I think that that's going to be huge for you. Phil, what do you got? So it's, it's holiday season, company holiday parties. Some are virtual. So are virtual parties hot or not? Um, I haven't had too many people ask about doing anything virtual right now. I think people are so excited to get back together for good or for bad, depending on the size of gatherings. We're trying not to be one of those <laughs> surprise spreader places. So I've had many people reach out about holiday parties or birthday parties, and I'm being pretty conservative and keeping it to still not big groups. Everybody must be vaccinated or negative tests, that whole thing, because um, I think people want to be together more now. So I haven't had a whole lot of virtual, but, um, but also trying to be responsible. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the easiest layup on hot or not. I've ever given anybody hot or not genealogy at home. Hot, of course. Explain, tell us, <laughs> you, you, you teased that right before the break. Tell everybody what genealogy is and what genealogy at home is now becoming. Yeah, so genealogy is part of the core um, business plan, like I spoke of. So it is a um, usually three to three plus hour event. So it's a eight to 10 people um, where we do a little kind of fun history um, of spirits and production over the centuries, um, focus mostly on gin, but production of everything along the way. We go in back in our fabulous uh, production area, do a specific tour to how exactly we make things. Then we come back to the bar and sit around the nice horseshoe of the bar. And we've also distilled 33 individual components that can comprise your gin. So the juniper by itself, coriander by itself, multiple citruses, florals, spices, um, barks, peppercorns. Um, so you can taste all these things individually in very small straws amounts. Don't get too excited, Dan. Um, <laughs> we want you to make a good decision at the end. Um, and we help you decide how to blend it and what um, amounts to put together to so you can go home with your own gin. Um, so that has been core since uh, the first, um, it took us six months to get everything distilled and roll it out in December of 2015. Um, since COVID, we obviously didn't do it in person for a year, almost year and a half. And then once we could, once uh, people were becoming vaccinated and feeling a little bit safer, um, we now just do private classes only for the time being of six to eight people. Um, I, I'm not comfortable mixing people that don't know each other yet. So used, used to be where people could sign up one person, two people, four people and be part of a group class. I'm still not there. Um, I want people to feel safe and be safe. Um, us, my staff to be safe. Um, so, um, so we have the private versions, but then um, we always wanted to do a genealogy to go at home kit, but realized how um, complicated it is in packaging and I'm the ultimate recycler. So I have a hard time wrapping myself around creating all this extra packaging as well. Um, and just <laughs> getting packaging right now is complicated in and of itself. Um, so uh, all of a sudden I'm like, well, we have all the spirit right here. So let's create a genealogy at home where somebody can take a quiz about some of the questions I ask in the class. So they don't get to have the full on premise experience, but they get to customize their own gin by me picking their brain. So they can purchase it on our website even. Um, it's uh, the first item on our shop page right now. We just rolled this out one week ago. Um, and you, um, 
pay your money for the gin itself. We will send you a newsletter with a link to your gin quiz to ask you a handful of questions uh, about your preferences. And then I develop a gin for you. Um, we've done work in person classes. We're recipe 970 something. So we've, I've done this almost a thousand times already. So I've got a pretty good under my belt um, feeling for when people answer questions, kind of how to spin things. And so, um, so somebody gets that lives in California ordered three of them for gifts for the holidays. So to three, I was going to ask so, that Kim, I, I don't mean to ask it, but that that's, yeah. I was kept thinking that sounds like a great gift. Yeah. So we'll ship it within two weeks. So you can even do it as a gift and you may not you know, we may not have two weeks to get them the actual final product, but that also means that you would have to take the quiz for that giftee. So the beauty of it is that you can just hold that email, print it out or send it to the giftee. They then take the quiz themselves for their own answers. And then within two weeks, so they may not get the bottle by Christmas, let's say, um, or maybe New Year's, but then they actually get to do the, the excitement yeah. of actually, you know, giving their answers themselves and then we get it to them. So beautiful. That's, that's the new thing. So, so you could create a Bobby Orr gin or an Albert Einstein gin based mm -hmm. on. Cool. Very cool. Interesting. Yep. Um, so memberships, hot or not? And explain. Hot. Customization and connectivity, right? So whether cool. um, for, for us, I, you know, one of the things back to, I guess, one of your questions earlier, I know I can get long winded. So sometimes I miss answering the full thing, but <laughs> so um we're very social. Brian and I are very social. And we realized along the way that this business is more of a social business that happens to make a bunch of stuff now. Um, because we, it, like I said, it's not only family with our staff, but um, a lot of our members, you know, we've become very good friends with. And so um, it's that connection to people that I think is our strength as opposed to just making one thing and getting it nationwide. And so that's, um, I'm hoping the path that, you know, pays off in the end at some point so I can, you know, someday live on the beach, but. <laughs> well, with, with, with a drink and a little tiny umbrella, right. That, but yes. you know, <laughs> you know, uh, I remember where we first met. I don't know if you remember it or not, but I remember where, where we first met. It was at Snohomish on the rocks. And for those listening, Snohomish on the rocks was this immense, large event. Maybe there weren't as many people I thought, but it seemed like we were all crammed together. Uh, at, at you know, it, it was an event where all craft distillers that could make it in or were, had booths and were were making drinks for people. And and Kim was working hard behind the scratch distillery, and that's that's where I first met her. I'm wondering, Kim because I really enjoyed those events. I think you probably did too. I, I'm guessing you got a lot of business from it. Do you see those events in the future again? I mean, and if so, how far down do you think it's going to be less packed? I mean, if they are able to come back, there's going to have to be more of a capacity issue. What do you see the future of these types of on the rocks type of events that used to be ubiquitous? They were all over the place. Now they're, it's like a ghost town. What do you see in that? I think they are going to be coming back. We actually did our first one, which is a whiskey focused one, um, Whiskies of the World that only had five locations in the United States that they did it in. And Seattle was one of them. We did that last month. And I was very cautious. Um, I've been very careful because, um, right, this business is my livelihood. And if I lose my sense of smell or taste, I am in trouble. <laughs> so, um, but we did that event. It was in Seattle. So it was a vaccination required. Um, they truly check as you come in. It was probably over the course of three hours. I think they did sell like 500 tickets, which I was, again, I was a little nervous about, but um, it was spaced very well. So it wasn't, it didn't feel as crowded as say Snohomish on the Rocks. It generally has been. Um, and so I think they will come back but I'd say next summer will probably be when you start to see more of them. I don't think everybody's a hundred percent comfortable and, you know, with now Omicron and all that, you know, right. who knows how the winter is going to go. So I probably won't do a whole lot during the winter and kind of wait and see and, and hope that we make it through by next summer. We'll see. Okay. So um, well, change gears a little bit down. You good? No, no, go ahead. We're going to get one more in before the break. Go ahead, Phil. Okay, so change gears a little bit. You're a family business, uh, working with your spouse, hot or not, and who's the boss at work? 
Um, it's hot for us. I don't think in the mainstream world, most people still can work together. <laughs> most people say, they comment all the time. They're like, I can't believe how well you guys work together that um, I could never work with my spouse, but um, um, I'm definitely the boss here. And he's definitely the boss at his office that I used to work at years ago. So we, we know our places, I guess. <laughs> Well, I know our place and our boss right now is our corporate sponsors. We're going to take a break to hear from them. Uh, and when we come back with our guest, Kim Carrick, for our famous Plead the Fifth, Fifth section of the show, Kim is probably going to be horrified. I'm going to ask her to think like a politician. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the Shrimp Tank. Plead the Fifth is brought to you by our corporate sponsors. Ideal Life 360, Cornerstone Financial. First Underwriters Insurance, Kitsap Sun Newspaper, BC Fitness Studio, and the Upstart Group. Please visit our website at www.shrimptankpodcast.com forward slash Seattle to learn more about these terrific companies. Now back to the show. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I'm co-host Phil Simchich. Today, our guest is Kim Carrick. And for our next segment, Plead the Fifth. And uh, Kim, I'm just going to make a quick, quick sponsor thing. Number one is uh, welcome to the Upstart Group. They're our new corporate sponsor. Many thanks to Sue Sanford and Lynn Folks, uh, both past uh, guests. And thank you for, for that and the Upstart Group. Also, Kim, I just want to mention uh, Scratch Distillery is one of the several businesses that sponsor our guest gift kit. Uh, there is for all of our guests that come on and Phil knows this, we send out a little something. And uh, part of that is a tasting room deal at Scratch Distillery. So if you've been a guest, you got one of these, you need to go and, and visit Kim and Brian directly there. You also get a shot glass. Kim, is it okay if we don't send you the shot glass? I'm guessing that you have plenty of shot glasses over there. Is that okay? Or should we, should we send you what one? I don't know. I had a staff person, you know, doesn't happen that often, but broke about a dozen the other day. I might need that <laughs> shot glass back. Okay. So listen, I, we're going to jump into plead the fifth and, and you're probably wondering, what am I talking about with politics? Now, listen, I, I know uh, you mentioned it was difficult. Distilleries were treated differently than breweries and wineries in a variety of different ways as far <laughs> as, you know, the two ounce pour and, and, and all of that. That sounds like it's been changing. I've taken advantage of sitting outside and having one of the uh, Tom, the, the Tom Collins, I think, or an old fashioned outside that you made. Uh, but I guess my hot or not, or my plead the fifth is this. If, if you could change one thing in the laws for the state of Washington as relates to distilleries, you had the ability to go in and change one thing, what would that be and why? Sorry, uh, I had a step person asking me a question right at that same time. That's so okay. <laughs> weird. Well, this life. is working in real time. This is how it works. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. So, you know, we, we a whole <laughs> A whole bunch of a whole bunch of uh, things happened recently that allowed distilleries to be able to act more like breweries, more like wineries, and how much they could pour and what they can do. And you mentioned how that was really a, a lifesaver for you. Uh, but I bet there's more. And if you had the ability to make one change in the law in the state of Washington that would help distilleries like you more, what would that be, and why? Uh, reduce the insane amount of taxes that you as the consumers have to pay for your spirits. Because Let people know really about is, that. Cause I don't, I don't think, I think people think they know, but, but tell, tell what's going on with that. Yeah. So the, uh, a lot of people called it the Costco law that passed a number of years ago that changed the way that uh, spirits are taxed and the size of business that you can have. And so why all that, when we deregulatized the state run stores, it was spun as this great thing. So now you get more variety and places to choose from um, for your you know, on-premise liquor store. 
but it really advantaged the the big boys for sure. So most of those state run stores could have stayed open, but they couldn't, they couldn't stay competitive anymore. But what they tried to say is that we need to increase these taxes in order to cover the cost of doing this, of deregulation. Um, honestly, the way that I even read it, and I think most people read it, was that that was going to go away after a certain point. Well, no, now that's not going away. And they say, oh, no, we're, we've not intended that. And um, how often does that happen? So we are the number one tax state in the U.S. by far. The next closest one is Oregon, I think, which is five times less tax than what we are. Um, so I won't go into the nerdiness of what those, those ratios, how it works but on our side, but basically that is, you know, especially for people that are on the border, like a distillery in Spokane, where they can go to Idaho and buy it, or in Vancouver, Washington, where people can go down to Portland and buy it, and they'll avoid this insane amount of tax that we have. Um, so that would be, that would be the one thing that if I could still get changed. Yeah, the taxes and the way the government's trying to support the economy during COVID and they're spending money like crazy, boy, it's 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 going to be a, a tough thing to change. Um, that's yeah. for sure. So in, in terms of your local business, um, what would be the, the biggest change uh, or or doing something different improvement? We talked a little bit about trends that, that you'd like to do right away in, in terms of your business in the next three to six months given our realities. Um, yeah, for us too, it, uh, going into uh, January through April is typically the slow time for alcohol industry because everybody's going out big in the fourth quarter and for the holidays. And then you have these darn New Year's resolutions, you know, so um, to try and get creative to um, figure out how to keep keep people coming in the slow times. So kind of that leans back to your virtual question, even though I said virtual is not as hot as what it was the last couple of years, we'll probably lean back to some of those things and do our exclusive um, whiskey virtual tasting, or we did uh, whiskey at different proofs to our exact same whiskey at six different proofs to show how it tastes different at these different um, alcohol proofs. So you can see why we chose 83 for ours. So um, those are probably the, the challenges and things that we'll We'll work on. So Kim, since you love working with your spouse and since you're his boss in the distillery, if we had Brian sitting right next to you and said, hey, Brian, what's one thing that Kim could improve upon in her running of the business as a business owner, what would Brian say? To try and figure out a way for us to not work the insane hours that we do. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on that but yeah yeah balance, no, I, life I, balance is a challenge yeah I, I can imagine especially in, in in his practice too so yeah yep so business is about continual learning sometimes by trial and error but what's one of the best books or podcasts that you've read or listened to in the last year um and i this was not prompted but dan's unleashed um so, and I've already signed up for his next, uh, the uh, texted about his next book, um, which the, when I read the Unleash the first time, I texted Dan a picture sitting on a beach reading it. <laughs> he did. And I am taking my first vacation in a few years in late January, Dan. So it better you're be gonna done take the so next... I can have book two. I want, I want another picture. I, I, I want another yes. picture. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was, boy, that was a nice surprise. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> You know, we've been we've been asking all our guests this uh, this uh, this year, and probably compile them, and it'll be fun to see. If if I said Kim, you, you got to start a new business, but it's it's not going to be what you're doing now. But it's going to be based on a hobby. And I know you guys work insane hours, but if you had a hobby that you'd say, you know what, uh, whether you're good at it or not, what would what would the hobby you'd start a business on? Um, we love to cycle, so bicycle, mm. so, you know, it might be some kind of, uh, on that beach somewhere, <laughs> you know, have a little, <laughs> a little, you know, maybe not as competitive, but nice little thing with a basket where people can go right along the, the beach somewhere. That would be my retirement, you know, maybe there you go. Some kayaks too or something. There you go. <laughs> So a fat tire e-bike, you don't have to do too much work and cruise along from. Yeah, from, from, you know, I, 
I have to say that I haven't, um, I hadn't ridden outside off my Peloton in over a year because I've had something called a frozen shoulder. So I had very little arm mobility. So the idea of being outside was very scary. Um, and I have a friend that got an e-bike um, and he's like, you have to try it. And I, I was a little gun shy, but I'm getting more range of motion. He's like, you'll be fine. And I was a little hesitant. It was so much fun. <laughs> in especially in the northwest i mean you have some intense hills and he's an incredible writer but he commutes every day to work and so this way he doesn't have to worry about taking a shower when he gets there and all that so anyways that was that was pretty fun so tell us um what advice you would give yourself as an 18 year old that would have made um you would have liked to have known back then uh, work for somebody else in the industry that you're going into be instead of have, you know, I have a lot of positivity. If you know, know your strengths, positivity is my number one. Well, now I know that there's negatives to your positives and, and to your strengths. <laughs> so knowing that, uh, uh, being a little bit more cautious. And as far as I said, like, you know, some of the expenses and being a little bit more realistic. Um, it's, it's been hard. I mean, we're finally feeling like we've been open now six and a half years. And I know that might be typical for a lot of businesses, but I was hoping it was more like two to three years before I felt like we we're making that turn. So um, again, a little bit more research and knowing your, you know, that your strengths also have a weak side of them and kind of evaluating that. <laughs> So I, I want to take a, a moment. I know we're getting near the end, but I, I before you start giving your contact information, all that, I want no, I want people to show up at your your tasting room because it's a, a really cool, unique, and I'm not sure if I'm coming up with the 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 right type of eclectic. I don't know what the word is, but it it's really kind of cool for people who live in the greater Puget Sound area. Edmonds, uh, you're right. You're within a couple minutes walk distance of the Edmonds Ferry. Talk about where you're located. And, and as people are looking at this, they can see your distillery. But what's what you're probably looking out in front of you <laughs> is really a cool spot. Talk about your tasting room, the outdoor patio, especially when it gets warmer. Talk about where you're located. Yeah, so we're just like, uh, like Dan said, a couple blocks from the actual ferry terminal itself. So um, the ferry lineup lines on the other side of the building. Um, so you're right by the, the, the sea. You've got that lovely salt air, but in your few blocks up to the main shopping part of town. So it's Edmonds has become a, a lot hipper, let's just say in the last 10 yeah. years, especially. Um, and amazing restaurants. I mean, there's so many people are moving out of the city up this direction. And even before COVID that was happening um, and moving up out of Ballard, you know, the kind of what people were moving out of core of Seattle to Ballard. Now it's moving up to Edmonds. And um, I have to say, I am so thankful to have been in this community through COVID because it is a very support local community. And so they have helped save our bacon and I appreciate it. Um, but it's, it's a really, um, it's big enough that it doesn't feel like a too small a town, small a town where everybody knows what everybody's doing, but yet at the same time, it's just got that nice, relatively small community feel. Um, our outside area is not huge, but we um, share the deck with a restaurant next door to us called the Pulo Bistro. So, um, you know, people come here, have cocktails before dinner, um, you know, buy something over there with our stuff in it. So um, many restaurants in town support us and carry our stuff as well. So um, it's a it's a very um, bright, happy place, um, you know, as, as opposed to a dark all wood, you know, so you can see the equipment behind, but in front of us in the tasting room is uh, the the scratch green, my my signature <laughs> green is on the wall and white countertops and um, very clean. And so it's a very welcoming, uh, comfortable atmosphere that people tell us all the time. Once in a great while, I'll sit down at the end of the night and pretend like I'm actually just sitting there and somebody's serving me and go, this is a pretty cool place. <laughs> that I don't get to just enjoy I'm in a, that way. <laughs> so you started off as a product company. And now you realize the, the, the power of memberships and, and community. When, when did that shift finally hit you that that was your value? I'd say probably almost two years into it when I, well, I always kind of knew I, I used to work in the wine industry too. So I, and um, 
was a big wine nerd. So I was, was a member of many different wine clubs. And so I always liked the concept, but I wasn't uh, logistically and limitations of all that stuff. Uh, had to get creative on how to figure out how to actually make it work on the distillery side. Um, so when we finally did that, um, also part of it was that distribution is not as easy in this industry as you expect it's going to be. So um, we were having a hard time finding a distributor that didn't want to pigeonhole us into a lower price point than what we could possibly sell our stuff at making it from scratch. So it was a, kind of a by necessity, we needed to get enough volume and we weren't getting it through distribution. So what other we need to figure this out and, and find another path. What that means for us in the, you know, the long term is, uh, is a challenge, you know, because it's, we're not distributed outside of the state of Washington and some small distribution in, in California where people can buy. We do sell online for quite a, um, quite a number of states that we can ship to, but that's not obviously um, volume, but at the same time, Again, I'm more about the connection I've become. I mean, I always was, but now we really have realized that we're more about the connection than just trying to get it far and wide. So it's the story behind it, I guess. Awesome. So Kim, thank you so much for being a guest here on The Shrimp Tank. For our listeners that want to get in touch with you and learn more about you and uh, Scratch Distillery, uh, how do they get more information? So um, Kim at scratchdistillery.com is my email, um, Scratch Distillery or Scratch Spirits. Both will take you to our website. Um, there's a shop page on there, so you can even um, check that out. You can find information on our genealogy, on our spirits club. You can sign up online. Our club is three bottles a quarter. Um, we ask for a year commitment, um, but some, most people stay in and Till they move away or even if they move away they you know often will still say and now i just have to ship it but um so yeah but yeah please come to visit easy to find us in Edmonds. just head for the ferry thanks kim everyone make sure you check out all the replays on shrimptankpodcast.com slash seattle and wherever you get your podcasts such as iheart apple google or spotify please follow us on our social media pages on youtube facebook and instagram well, Kim, thank you for being here. Thank you for your sponsorship of, of our show. Uh, thanks for coming in on short notice. And thanks for putting up with me coming in. And I'm not just, I, I don't just email you. I actually come in and, and make you work to, to, to fill, fill up my, uh, my basket, so to speak. So thanks for putting up with, with me and, and for all that you do for the community. Phil, thank you very much. It's great to have you. Uh, we'll be talking to you next year. So for you, uh, especially happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy new year, everybody. We're taking next week off. That's right. We're taking a week off before Christmas. So it'll be two weeks from today, Wednesday, December the 29th. Uh, make sure you're on our Facebook page so you can join us. I will be, I have Michelle Bomberger as the co-host. Craig Swanson with Creative Live is going to be our guest at the time. So in the meantime, please be safe, be well, be prosperous. For those who celebrate, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody. Uh, because until two weeks from now, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp.